Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Amber Kaiser, and I'm a member of the communications team at the Dog Aging Project. We're super happy to have you back for our second community appreciation event. Uh, just a little bit of technical stuff. You're all watching via YouTube Live. If you want to ask questions, you can add them to the chat on the live video. Or if you open another browser window and go to the dog park, you can click on the red hack appreciation banner and that um, link will allow you to ask questions. It's also included in the YouTube description below this video. Uh, keep in mind that when you ask a question or post a comment on the thread in the dog park, you'll be entered to win our giveaway drawing. And during the Q&A a little bit later, we'll try to respond to as many of those questions as possible. We don't get to them all, we'll follow up on the dog park. Uh, we are so happy to have you here with us this morning and I'm gonna hand it over to Harmony. Hi there, gang. Um, I'm Harmony Peraza. I'm the study participant manager for the Dog Aging Project and also a proud member of our Core C communications team along with Amber. Um, I also have a pack member by the name of Oboy, oh and he is number 297. He is a German Shepherd. Um, very proud of that guy. Um, as a brief project timeline overview, I'm just going to refer to my notes and give um, our group in attendance a bit of an update on what we've been doing lately and where, where we're headed. So we very recently started to invite some of the PAC members um, to some of our cohorts, specifically foundation and precision. Um, the participants that accept invitations to these cohorts um, will be invited to share their, compa uh, their companions genetic and biologic samples with us through kits that we send you. Um, analysis of a small number of these uh, samples have already gotten underway and we're very proud that we're making process uh, progress on those. Um, we're also very excited to be speaking with Dr. Matt Caberline today. He is one of the co-leaders of the Dog Aging Project and he's here to talk about the science of aging. Um, after Dr. Caberline's presentation, we'll have a question and answer session. Uh, and we'll address many of your questions, as many as we possibly can today, and then look for further answers in the dog park forum thereafter. Um, a bit of information on uh, Dr. Caberline. Uh, he's the professor of pathology and co-director for the Nathan Schock Center and director of healthy aging and longevity research at the University of Washington. Dr. Caberline studies the basic, uh, basic biology of aging with a particular focus on evolutionary conserved mechanisms. Um, Dr. Caberline uh, oversees the overall dog aging project with Daniel Promislow and Dr. Kate Creevy. And he is a lead investigator of the triad or test of rapamycin in aging dogs trial in the U19. Uh, Dr. Caberline's canine companion is Dobby, a nine-year-old German shepherd whom he loves dearly. Um, Dr. Caroline, we're going to hand it off to you for your fascinating discussion. All right. Thank you, Harmony. Uh, let me pull up my slide here. Hopefully everybody can see this. Uh, thank you all for taking time out of your Saturday to, to join us. So um, as Harmony mentioned, my job today is to sort of give an introduction to the science of aging. Um, and then I'll, I'll just briefly touch on how, um, how we're trying to uh, apply that to the dog aging project. Um, so just to start, I, I think it's useful to uh, appreciate kind of the, the, the way that um, we have approached health from a societal perspective and particularly from a medical and, and veterinary perspective historically. So, so traditionally, um, most of our approach to health, whether that's in humans or in dogs, um, has really been focused around individual diseases. And so what's shown here are, are several of the leading causes of death and disability in humans. And you will um, quickly notice that these are also diseases that tend to afflict uh, dogs as they get older. Um, and typically the, the approach here has been to wait until a person or a dog develops one of these diseases and then to try to either cure the disease or at least treat the symptoms of the disease. And, and this is what I think of as 20th century or even 19th century medicine. 
Um, and one of the points I want to make today is that all of these diseases share a single greatest risk factor. And it might not be what you think it is. It's not how much you eat or whether you smoke or how much alcohol you consume or whether you exercise, it's really how old you are. And again, that's the same in dogs as it is in, in people. So age is certainly without question the greatest risk factor for all of these different diseases and, and, and many other declines in, in function. And the whole point of the work that I do and many others in the field of aging research or, or uh, uh, another word that's used to describe this kind of research is geroscience, um, is really to understand what are the biological mechanisms of aging with the expectation that if we can understand those mechanisms, we have the potential to actually target those mechanisms directly to delay the onset and progression of all of these diseases and declines in function simultaneously. So that's really the, the big picture idea that I want to I want to leave you with today is, is this is this is what I call 21st century medicine. Instead of waiting until people are sick or dogs are sick and trying to approach this at one disease at a time, what we really want to do is target the root cause of all of these diseases to prevent uh, the onset and progression and expand the period of life that is spent free from chronic disease and disability. Um, and you can do some estimates about what that would actually mean in terms of life expectancy. So this is data for humans. There is no equivalent data for dogs yet. Um, uh, so this is work that was originally done by a demographer named J. L. Shansky, and he just asked the question, what would the effect be on life expectancy for a typical 50-year-old woman from curing individual diseases? Uh, and this actually turns out to be mathematically a pretty easy question to answer because the CDC does a really good job of keeping track of what people die from. So if you just take out all cancer related deaths, it turns out that that only leads to about a three year increase in life expectancy for a typical 50 year old woman in the United States. The same thing's true for heart disease. And even if you're able to cure both of those diseases, you get about seven years of added life expectancy. So to me, that those numbers actually were, were quite strikingly less than I thought they would be, um, especially given how much we have focused on things like the war on cancer. Um, and I, I, wanna, I do want to make a point that, that from an individual perspective, curing an individual's cancer, whether it's a family member or your dog, is extremely important. You want that cancer gone. But from a population perspective, the effect is much smaller, I think, than most people uh, uh, expect. Um, now, if we compare that to the predicted or hypothetical effect of slowing aging, which I'll tell you right now, this is pretty routine in laboratory animals. And I'll, I'll, in a second, I'll show you some examples of how we are able to slow aging in laboratory animals. We haven't proven yet that this is feasible or that the same approaches will work in dogs uh, or in people. Uh, but if we're able to translate what has, has been accomplished in laboratory animals to people, that would lead to a much more significant increase in life expectancy and probably even more importantly, as illustrated by the green portion of this bar here, most of those years are expected to be spent in good health because you have delayed the onset and progression of all of the diseases and all of the functional declines of aging simultaneously. And that, that uh, refers to this term, the longevity dividend, the added value that you get from targeting aging versus trying to cure disease. It also leads into, into this concept of health span, which I think is really important. So, you know, we talk a lot about lifespan. I just showed you data for life expectancy because it's easy to measure. Um, but what's much more important than lifespan is the, the proportion of life that is spent in good health. What we really want to do is push those diseases of aging back as far as possible towards the end of life so that our dogs and, and our family members and ourselves can, can maintain good health for as long as possible. And so the goal here is really to maximize health span. Um, if we increase lifespan at the same time, that's great. And everything that I've seen from studies in laboratory animals suggests that's the case, but it really is important to keep in mind that, that, that we really want to maximize that period of healthy life free from chronic disease and disability. So I just want to um, finish up by talking about a couple of big picture ideas. So I think sometimes when, um, when, when people like me, scientists who study aging, start talking about slowing aging and, and increasing lifespan, it sounds a little bit like science fiction. And I just want to make the point that, that this is absolutely science fact. This is happening. And it's really not 
too surprising when you take a step back and, and just think about what aging is. So one of the points I wanna leave you with is that aging is just biology. And what I mean by that is that if you look across the animal kingdom, you will see that nature has figured out how to change the rate of aging by many orders of magnitude. So there are very short-lived animals like fruit flies, which will live a few months. Uh, unfortunately, our, our companion dogs and, and cats and other pets don't live long enough. Uh, so a typical dog will live about 10 years. That of course depends on the size of the dog. And then there are some really <clears throat> interesting animals that actually live much longer than people do. There are whales that will live a couple hundred years or even some clams that can live five centuries. So the point here is that nature has figured out how to change the rate of aging by, by a huge magnitude. And if you think about what's different about these different animals, it's really their DNA, their genetics and the environment that they live in. And that genetics plus environment is just biology. So if we can understand what those mechanisms are, we have the potential to actually modify the rate of aging and improve health in our pets and eventually in ourselves. Um, the other point I wanna make is that this is happening. So there's certainly a lot that remains to be understood about the biology of aging, but a lot of progress has been made to the point where we actually have what we call hallmarks of aging, <clears throat> which are highly conserved mechanisms that seem to be shared about the aging process across all of those animals that I just showed you. Um, and so what these hallmarks are isn't really important for today's discussion, um, but I think it is important to appreciate <clears throat> that each of these hallmarks represent, at least in principle, targets that can be, that can be approached to delay the onset of age-related diseases. Um, we're also learning how to measure biological aging. And so I wanna present this concept of biological age versus chronological age. So chronological age is easy to understand. It's how long you've been alive, right? Um, biological age is a little bit different because, and this reflects the fact that different individuals age at different rates or different animals age at different rates. So two chronologically aged 10 year old dogs might have very different biological ages if, ages if one individual is aging faster than the other. And you can also start to look across species. So this is uh, data from a paper that was recent published, recently published out of Trey Eidecker's lab, where they used this tool called the epigenetic clock, which really just refers to marks that happen on the DNA. So in this case, it's methylation. Um, epigenetic clocks are one of the things that we're measuring in the Dog Aging Project that gives you what many people think is now a pretty good measure of biological age. And they asked, if we look at these marks that happen, that change during aging, and we compare people to dogs, we can learn something about the relationship between the rate of aging in dogs and the rate of aging in people. And I think, you know, we're all sort of familiar with this idea that um, one human year is about equal to seven dog years. And that's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, but, but what they found was really interesting, which is that while on average, that relationship is, is pretty good, it changed the rate of difference in aging between dogs and people changes over the lifespan. So early on in a dog's life, uh, one human year may be more like 15 dog years. Uh, whereas as the dogs are getting older, their rate of aging starts to approach something that looks more like the rate of human aging, at least based on this epigenetic clock. Um, other clocks are being developed. Uh, and what's really exciting is the application of new artificial intelligence tools to identify even more sophisticated signatures of biological age. And here at the Dog Aging Project, we're applying all of these tools to try to understand the aging process in our pets. Um, I mentioned that we have several ways to slow aging in laboratory animals. This is just a, a partial list of some of the genetic approaches that can be taken. And by that, I mean that we can actually perturb the, the genome of, of laboratory animals and make them live longer and healthier or lifestyle changes. Those can be dietary changes or pharmacological interventions, drugs that seem to slow the aging process. And, and one that, that I study and that I'm very interested in and that we're interested in here at the Dog Aging Project is a drug called rapamycin, which is a, a molecule that inhibits a protein called mTOR. So these are, are uh, sort of equivalent approaches to slow aging. Um, and we're studying rapamycin uh, to understand whether or not this might be an effective way to, to increase health span or healthy longevity in our pets. Um, and so I'll just finish up by talking very briefly about rapamycin. It's an interesting molecule. It was actually identified on Easter Island, which is also known as Rapa Nui. That's where these statues are found. And that's where the drug gets its name from. Um, we're excited about rapamycin because it's 
Currently, the most effective longevity drug that's been identified um, in mice, we routinely see uh, effects on lifespan up to about a 30% increase in average lifespan. Importantly, it starts or it works even when, when treatment is started in middle age. And even more importantly, it's not only lifespan that's extended, but it seems to improve function across multiple tissues and organs. And in some cases, even reverse the dysfunction of aging that's already happened. And that's been seen in the heart, in the immune system and in the oral cavity in mice. So it's a pretty exciting uh, area of research right now. Um, and so I'll just finish up by, uh, by leaving you with, with sort of a big picture message on the dog aging project. There are, we're approaching aging from two complementary uh, strategies. One is the, the very large longitudinal study of aging, which you are all part of as part of the Dog Aging Project PAC. And the goal there is to define and understand what are the most important factors that influence healthy aging in pet dogs. Uh, and then as Harmony alluded to, we have a clinical trial, which is actually aimed at testing whether rapamycin can slow aging, increase lifespan and increase health span in pet dogs. And with that, I will stop and I'm happy to, uh, to take any questions that, that people might have. And I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Kieberlein. That was fascinating. Um, I know that there are a lot of questions that have been coming through. Uh, let me just peek at a couple of those. Um, and I think maybe Harmony is going to join us too. So first question for you though, uh, Dr. Kieberlein, you talked a little bit about the similarities between aging in dogs and humans. And, and one, one of our uh, viewers has asked, what are those, you know, are there more similarities, but especially what are the differences too between dogs and human aging? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. So, so I'll start with sort of the easy answer, which is that um, that's actually one of the important things that we're trying to understand at the Dog Aging Project. Um, I think that uh, we don't know about all of the similarities and differences. So, so, so that's, that's sort of the big picture answer. There are certainly um, some differences that we can point to, at least in terms of specific diseases and prevalence of diseases in dogs and people. So for example, um, dogs tend to experience less vascular disease with aging than people do. Or even though dogs uh, experience an uh, exponential increase in risk of cancer with age, like people do, the types of cancers, the specific types of cancers that dogs tend to get when they're older are different than the specific types of cancers that people tend to get when they're older. So there are some differences there and understanding the, the mechanisms um, uh, will be an important part of, of, of what we do at the Dog Aging Project over the next few years. But I, but I think that the probably more important point to, to appreciate is that all of those hallmarks of aging that I showed you um, appear to be the same in dogs and people. So the underlying sort of, we think the hypothesis is that the underlying molecular mechanisms of aging are quite similar. The ultimate outcomes in terms of specific uh, declines in function and diseases might be somewhat different between dogs and aging. That's a great segue into this next question. Um, about uh, why, so why, so you showed us that graph. So this question is relative to that graph where you showed how um, puppies are aging at a much faster rate than baby humans. And then that seems to flatten out. And so that by the time dogs are senior dogs, their rate of aging appears to be fairly similar to humans. So, you know, if those underlying molecular mechanisms may be the same, how, how, how do you account for that difference in the rate of aging over the lifespan of dogs? Right, so, uh, so I guess um, one way to think about this is, and this, if you think about that slide that I showed with all the different animals, right? So, so it's clear that these rates of aging can be um, modified in nature, right? And those are probably primarily genetic differences. So changes in the DNA that influence the, the, uh, the rate at which these hallmarks of aging are causing dysfunction in our, in our tissues. Um, in the specific case that I showed, um, and this actually fits with a, a, a large body of literature on the evolutionary biology of aging, there's a connection between the rate at which animals develop and reach uh, reproductive maturation and their rate of aging 
after that. So, so we all, probably everybody on this call is, is familiar with the idea that, that most dogs will reach reproductive maturation. They can have puppies within a year, some breeds even as early as six months. Now, if you compare that to a human, right, it takes a decade or more. So that probably explains that early life, you know, very different, uh, uh, difference in the rate of aging between dogs and humans. And then post-reproductively, that rate tends to, tends to flatten out, but it's still the case that even at old age, dogs are aging faster than people are. It's just no longer a 15 to one or seven to one relationship. It's maybe more like a three to one relationship. And I should also mention, I don't want to mislead people, that epigenetic clock is still, I mean, it, it predicts chronological age very well, it's still a little bit hypothetical the extent to which it's reflecting biological age. So this is an area, this is cutting edge research right now. So, so we're still learning you know, what the epigenetic clock means biologically and mechanistically. And I, I don't want people to think that it is an absolute reflection of biological aging. I am glad you mentioned the slide with all the animals. I had no idea a naked mole rat could live 32 years. That's amazing. <laughs> It is. And I think, you know, what's also amazing is that naked mole rats are very genetically close to, to mice and rats, um, which will live three years, right? So somehow nature has figured out how to slow aging tenfold uh, in very genetically closely related animals. And if we can understand what those differences are, uh, they may actually be useful in understanding aging in dogs and people. So you mentioned a little, you were, you were talking a little bit about um, cancer and vascular disease and other diseases of aging. Um, we had a question from Mr. Darcy about cognitive decline. So the question is certain studies have shown that learning and maintaining skills can protect against cognitive decline in humans. Have there been any studies yet to see if this applies to dogs? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'm not aware of any studies yet in dogs definitively showing that that um, maintaining cognitive activity uh, late in life is going to be protect protective against cognitive decline. My intuition is that it probably would. And so you should absolutely go out and play games with your, your older dog and your younger dog. Um, but I think, you know, this area of understanding cognitive decline during aging in dogs is, is a, a very uh, important and expanding area of interest. And it's one of our major interests at the, the Dog Aging Project. Uh, so Dr. Evan McLean, who's, who's on our team, is a leader in understanding cognitive function in, in dogs. And um, for all of you who are in the pack, you've probably already gotten the survey cognitive assessment. Um, and, and Evan will be pioneering uh, sort of more in-depth uh, uh, tests that owners can, can carry out with their dogs to try to understand how, do, how does cognitive function change in dogs um, and, and does it look like changes in cognitive function that we see in people? Uh, maybe I'll direct a question at Harmony since she's our study subject manager. Um, can you talk a little bit about when those cognitive studies might be coming to our PAC members? Yes, we're all looking forward to it. And it's looking like the initial rollout to some small groups is going to start in May. Um, and those cognitive assessments are going to be enjoyable for owners and dogs alike, they're going to involve um, sniffing exercises. And there may be a variety, but essentially um, dogs will be given uh, the opportunity to seek out treats hidden in multiple small boxes. So it'll be a, a great bonding and engaging experience for owner and dog. And there will be thorough instructions as to how to play the game, but that is one of them, a sniffing exercise for dogs to discover the hidden treat. And, and if people are super impatient for those to roll out, <laughs> um, because we are gonna be rolling them out in sort of small groups um, in case we need to provide a lot of support for participants. Right. Um, are, there, are there things that are fun activities for people to do with their dogs, senior or otherwise? Yeah, absolutely. There, there certainly are. And, um, you know, not only do our, our puppies, adults, you know, and, and middle-aged dogs need to remain engaged with, but, you know, especially on the, the heels of the cognitive decline discussion, 
our senior dogs too. Um, so a lot of the fun activities that we can do with our dogs um, for engagement purposes are starting with just the simple walks and massages and talking to your dog, but moving on to fun activities you can even get your kids involved with. Um, playing hide and seek in the house with your dog. If you can get your dog to do a sit stay or have another family member sort of hang on to them while you go and hide, having a nice treat in your pocket is a, is a great reward for the dog. Be very quiet and then call your dog to come and find you. So dogs love hide and seek. Dogs love search for the treat under the cup. Um, have three overturned plastic cups with a treat underneath one of them and direct your dog to find where the special treat is. And once they discover which cup it's under, give it to them and reward them uh, you know, with the treat and, and lots of love. Um, additionally, for our senior dogs specifically, all dogs need exercise appropriately, but keep your senior dogs moving um, through appropriate exercise. And when we discuss appropriate exercise, it just means because aging changes can happen with our dog, not only cognitively, but also physically, um, make sure that your veterinarian is on board with the exercise program that you have with your dog, but keep those senior dogs walking, playing fetch, low impact exercise like swimming is a great idea, not only physically, but also cognitively. Keep that bond going even when they've got the gray muzzle. <laughs> That's awesome. I taught, I taught my dog to search for each of my kids ind independently. Right. So like the, the dog stays with me, the kids hide. And then I'm like, hey, go find, go find Beryl, go find her. Where is she? And that's really fun. <laughs> that's, that's a great game. Very specific. <laughs> one of the, um, one of our participants, part, her dog is involved in barn hunt activities. So that's a lot of scent work and nose work activities. And um, some of you uh, pack members will probably know, remember that in the health and life experience survey, we ask if your dog participates in agility or you know, mushing or anything like that. It's gonna be really interesting for us to um, be able to see how these cognitive activities go with dogs who already participate in some of those, you know, more challenging activities. So yeah, that's going to be agree. pretty cool. I agree. Amber. Uh, going back to you, Dr. Kaberlein, um, we had a question. Um, how do you control for the different factors like diet or activity and determining, determining the best way to extend our dog's healthy lifespan? Good question. So, so the first thing I would say is we're not trying to control for those things uh, in our study. So this is where a, a study like ours in companion dogs that are living in the real world differs from a laboratory study where, you know, you try to control for everything except for one variable, right? Um, and it might be diet or it might be something else. So that's a, that's a key difference about the dog aging project is this is not in any way a laboratory study. This is a study of our pets living with us in the real world. And what we want to do is, is understand what are the relationships between those environmental, so I would put diet under environment, those environmental factors that are associated with health outcomes during aging. And that could be individual diseases, it could be lifespan, it could be overall health, it could be activity, it could be cognitive function. Um, so that that really isn't, it's an important difference. Um, and I think it's, it's, you know, this is, this is the one of the real values of the dog aging project is, is to really understand what impacts aging in the real world, in the world that our dogs live in and share with us. I think it might be good to point out too, just to piggyback on your answer that, that that's precisely why our study is so large and so expansive, right? In order for us to really see what's happening in the real lives of real dogs in their real environments, we have to study lots and lots and lots of them. Yeah, that's right. And I should also add, I meant to say, if you note in the health and life experiences survey, that's why we have so many questions around the environment, including diet, so that we will have that information for all of the dogs in the pack. Um, and so that we will, as those dogs continue to age, we will be able to, to identify relationships between the information that you've provided us in, in the HLES and in other surveys that come out. And this is why the Dog Aging Project is, I mean, it truly is a citizen science project. All of you are citizen scientists, as are your dogs, helping us to understand the aging process in our pets. 
Thank you so much. I, I actually can't believe that our time is already basically up for today. Um, this has been a fascinating conversation. I'm so glad that you were able to join us and, and talk to us about the work that you do. Dr. Cableine, thank you so much. It's my pleasure. As um, like last time, our community outreach coordinator, Eric, who Harmony, Harmony and I like to call the dog father of the dog park, uh, will be getting in touch with our giveaway winners after this. Um, again, like last time, we will post, um, we will try to answer the rest of your questions on the forum um, as, as we're able to. This video will be available immediately after the event. So if your friends and family want to share it or watch it, you um, are welcome to share the link. And you know, as, as we were just talking about, we're always welcoming uh, new dogs into the Dog Aging Project. Um, you know, we, we uh, restrict that to one dog per household, but that means you should tell all your friends who haven't enrolled a dog yet to join us here in the Dog Aging Project. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Harmony to send us off, but I just wanna thank everybody for being here. Yeah, thanks, Amber. This has been a great half hour. Um, PAC members, just, to, uh, just please know how important you are to us. And we enjoy so much being a part of this project and learning so much about not only your dogs, but you as individuals. I mean, you and your dogs, um, you're an extension of our family. And we couldn't do this without you and the great time that you put in and the information and the passion that you share with the Dog Aging Project. So thank you continue to reach out with your questions and your communications. We love talking to you, um, not only on the forum, but remember if you wanna send us an email, it's team at dogagingproject.org. And we look so forward to hearing from you and continuing on this fantastic journey. And we are thrilled about the, the next live event that we're gonna have. It's gonna be at some point in March and details um, to that next event will be on the way. And thank you for sharing your Saturday with us. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, everybody.